Well, good evening. Uh, my name is uh, Joel Westfall, and I am the Deputy Director of the Joel R. Ford Presidential Library and Museum. Uh, it is my pleasure to welcome you tonight uh, for tonight's program. Um, before we begin, uh, one of our traditions here for our Veterans Day program uh, is that I'd like to ask any veteran in the audience to stand. Thank you for your sacrifice, for your family sacrifice, and for your service to our, our country. Thank you. So before I'm, uh, I'm going to introduce our, our guest tonight, I'm going to talk about some future programs we have coming up. Uh, and that is, uh, first of all, on November 16th, um, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, on November 16th, we have a World Affairs, uh, World Affairs um, Chinatown Hall uh, that will be here. should be an industry program. You can sign up for that by going to the World Affairs website. Following that, we have a very special event going on November 17th. I'm not going to steal a person, a certain individual's thunder who I know is going to talk about that event later on. Uh, but it is a Wine in the White House event. Uh, it is, uh, last year was one of my absolute all-time favorite, all-time favorite events in my six years here. But I know, I know Gleaves is going to talk about that at the end of the program. Uh, on December 7th, on Pearl Harbor Day, we are having Jonathan Darman here talk about his book, Becoming FDR. And on December 13th, we have Mr. Bill Brantz coming to talk about Watergate in the 1970s. Um, also coming up um, on November 17th, sorry, November 19th, we have the Ford Presidential Express, which will be available upstairs, and which will feature again this year, as we've done every year since we've had this wonderful exhibit, train exhibit, uh, a new, a new modeled building, uh, and this year's modeled building is a complete replica of this museum. So come by and uh, and check it out. Uh, there will be some reduced. Uh, you all, most of you are friends of Ford, so you can come anytime for free you want. Uh, but if you're not, uh, please come by. Uh, we have a special special times beginning during when school is out for the kids can come here and see the train for free. And then uh, beginning early in uh, January, we've got a special exhibit from the National Guitar Museum coming here. And we are all looking forward to that. Uh, that it's the, if it's the first time, it will be anywhere in the country. It will be here beginning on January 27th. So to, to start introducing our, our guest for the night. Uh, it does not matter which channel you watch or the feeds you read, whether that is CNN, Fox, MSN, MSNBC, BBC, you have probably seen or read something from tonight's guest, Colonel John Spencer. He is one, right now, of the most sought after interviews and contributors talking about the war in Ukraine today. His books, Connected Soldiers, uh, as well as the brand new one on urban warfare, come with the highest recommendations from America's top warriors like Petraeus, McChrystal, McMaster, and even one from one of our really good friends here at the Ford Library and Museum, Sir Anthony Beaver. His book, Connected Soldiers, has, in my view, some of the best, connect, uh, best combinations you want to see in a book. It is a part leadership study. It is a part military history. It is a part memoir. Now, just a little bit about Colonel Spencer's background. He is an award-winning scholar, professor, author, combat veteran, an internationally recognized expert and advisor on urban warfare and other military-related topics. Considered one of the world's leading experts on urban warfare, he has served as an advisor to four-star generals and other senior leaders in the U.S. Army as part of the strategic research groups from the Pentagon to the United States Military Academy at West Point. Serving over 25 years in the active Army as an infantry soldier while on active duty, Colonel Spencer has held ranks from private to sergeant for cl first class, from second lieutenant to major. His assignments as an Army officer included two combat deployments to Iraq as both an infantry platoon leader and company commander, a ranger instructor with the Army's Ranger School, a Joint Chief of Staff and Army Staff intern, 
fellow of, with the Joint Staff, to Chief of Staff of the Army Strategic Studies Group, and co-founder, strategic planner, and deputy director of the Modern War Institute at West Point. Colonel Spencer currently serves as the Chair of Urban Warfare Studies for the Modern War Institute at West Point, a research center at the United States Military Academy. He is the co-director of the Urban Warfare Project and host of the Urban Warfare Project podcast. He also serves as a colonel in the California State Guard with the assignment to the 40th Infantry Division, California Army, California Army National Guard as the Director of Urban Warfare Training. Please give a warm welcome to Colonel Spencer as he comes on stage to join me in talking about Connected Soldiers and the war in Ukraine. Thanks for that introduction, Joel. That was a lot. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for being here. And uh, I really enjoyed the book. And uh, I'm hoping we, uh, we sell, some, sell some of them today. But let's, uh, let's talk about that book. So I had mentioned to you the other night that if I would ever put, a, uh, if I would ever put a, um, something on the back of my car, a bumper sticker on the back of my car, it would be, all my best friends are Mustangs. So for those in the audience who do not know, can you relate? to what a Mustang is and what got you to decide why you wanted to make that jump. Sure, so that's a, a name I, I, I hold with honor. I don't know if I put it as a bumper sticker, but a Mustang is somebody who joined the military as an enlisted soldier. So I joined out of high school at 17 as a private um, and had just an amazing experience as an enlisted soldier all the way up to sergeant. And a Mustang is a basically an enlisted soldier who then converts to the dark side and becomes an officer. Uh, uh, and all the shun that it comes with that from your enlisted personnel to become an officer. So they, I went to Officer Canada School and then became a second lieutenant, really going back to the, not to the bottom, but going back to the beginning of a uh, path, let's say, but it's, they're called Mustangs. So you talk about an event in the book where it really, in my opinion, hasn't gotten the attention from a military history perspective that I think it deserves. Um, so let's talk about the night jump that you made with the 173rd Combat Infantry Regiment. Um, no, no moon phase, can't see a thing, mud up to the eyeballs. Uh, I think you called it in the book one of the most physically, if not the most physically challenging experience of your, of your life. So can you talk and relate about that? Absolutely. And it, it, it's still to this day, after running marathons, triathlons, doing the best ranger competition, which is a three-day event in the military, still the hardest physical night of my entire life. So if, if, if you don't know from the, from the book, um, actually I have Turkey to thank for doing a combat jump into Iraq. So when the Iraq invasion was announced, the 4th Infantry Division was on boats headed towards Turkey to drive through into the north to attack into Iraq in the north. Um, Turkey at the last minute said, no, I don't, I, don't, I, don't want to, I don't want to let you in. Uh, so they canceled, and the 4th Infantry Division had to go on a boat around um, and, and go to Kuwait. So they put in the 173rd, which is a small, a small unit for the Army of 1,000 soldiers, and said that we would jump in to the north to replace the 4th Infantry Division. Um, and if you do a combat jump, you get a combat star on your uniform for the rest of your career. And it's, for us, it's very important as part of our identity which I talk a lot about in the book, and, and, and I had some conversations tonight, that if you can tie yourself to the greatest generation, to World War II, to some of those combat jumps, it's like a, you know, just a, a career identifying event. So very motivated to be a part of the opportunity to conduct, I think it was like the 27th or 29th combat jump in, in the Army's history, as in a mass jump, not counting special forces, we don't count those guys. Uh, so 1,000 soldiers jumping into northern Iraq in March of 2003, nighttime jump, um, 15 C-17s. I've never seen one of these things before, and they're, they're as big as this building. They're, they're, they're huge. Um, everything's going just like I dreamed. Uh, arrive to a field where ACDC and all this motivating music is playing, and we're rigging up, getting ready for the jump. Everything's going great. We fly five hours from Italy, where I was stationed, straight into Iraq. Um, everything I'd ever dreamed of. Got number one jumper out the door, which is a big, big deal for us. Hit the ground, and, and that's when 
my night more. You couldn't see the ground. I couldn't see the ground. <laughs> no, I try to explain that in the book. You really can't visualize that being sucked out of an airplane that's going over you know 160 miles per hour and the. Uh, I mean, it literally is like a, it just shoots you out of a, a giant, giant of a person, and then it's just silence and you float to the ground. You, I can't see anything, and actually. We had knocked a power to the little village that was on the ground because Special Forces is usually there before as Pathfinders. So it was, it was, I mean, I couldn't see my hand in front of my face, let alone prepare for the impact of the ground, which is always a very, let's say, better than any coffee you ever have. Uh, it's shocking. But I hit the ground. I now know, I didn't know when I was jumping in, it's something they forgot to tell us is that it had been raining for like a week. Uh, that, that the, the, the drop zone they picked for us was actually a rice field and not like a, a Vietnam like patty, patty but it was, it, it was knee deep mud uh, and if you I didn't know when you jump into combat because we never jumped with that kind of weight that your every single person's weight rucksack was over 100 pounds some 150, 160 as in their backpack alone so as I put that on my back and tried to walk in that mud. It just wasn't happening. And I, I, I got very scared. And I write about this in a book. My, in all my combat experiences, all my military career, I, I never feared dying by hand of the enemy. I feared failing. So this is three minutes into my combat experience as a platoon leader, and I'm failing because I can't move more than two feet without falling down and using every muscle in my body to get back up and to move with that rucksack. It was a very traumatic um, and it bothers me today, the feeling that I started to feel that I was, I was going to fail. I wasn't going to even, even get to the 800-meter point where I was supposed to get to. Uh, so that was my introduction into combat. So I, I have a lot of favorite parts of, of your book. Uh, one of them is uh, how you delve really deeply into the social co uh, cohesion and, and the differences between your two tours in Iraq in 2003 and then later on in 2008. Uh, how, did, how did the social media change soldiers' connections and what were, there, what, what were some of the concerns that you had as a leader when you saw these, these differences? Yeah, it's, a, it, it's what I tried to start the book with and I, unfortunately I had to weave in a little bit of academics and study. I mean, I start the book with a, just an exploration, which many people have asked in time, why do soldiers fight? Why are soldiers willing to die? Why do they even fight in war? And the number one answer and across longitudinal studies of many armies, from, the, from American to German to Israel, the number one overriding answer is, is they fight for each other. They fight for the person to the left and right. And of course, they fight for a cause and country and... Uh, service and honor and everything, but when it comes down to dying, they're, they're fighting for the people to the left and right. That bond is called cohesion. Uh, it's called social cohesion when, when you actually build a bond because of interpersonal relationship. There's also this other thing called task cohesion that's really prevalent in things like sports and in, in business and everything that we all have to recognize that we have to work together to achieve the goal. Uh, in the military, social cohesion means I have to I don't have to love a person, as in I, I, I served with a lot of people I didn't like, uh, maybe even one in the audience, just, just joking. Uh, but you build a bond with a person where you know that that person is willing to die for you and you're willing to die for them, the only way you're going to survive. It's historic. It goes, you know, even before the Iliad and all the writings of war. I knew that going into the military. I call it the Band of the Brothers effect in the book, just because... You know, Tom Hanks made it synonymous with that cohesion. So when I jumped into combat in 2003, it was there. Everything I had imagined, it, it, is, it wasn't there in the beginning, but it slowly started to form. Like, we just experienced this jump together. We all went through that mud together. The bond just started to, to establish. We sat around our vehicles and just talked to each other. I talked to my soldiers over the radio, even in my vehicle. We were bonding and to the point where we became a brotherhood. We weren't connected to the outside world. Um, of course, every soldier has family, you know, wives, husbands, children that they really love and they miss when they're in war. But across the history of war, there's always been a separation. Soldiers go off to war. They write letters home. Um, and in 2003, that was what was happening. I was writing, I put it in the book, even pictures of us writing notes on cardboard and, and mailing it home. Uh, or making a call once every three months, 
that meant that we, we still loved everything at home, but we also had a family at war that we knew we needed for survival. Um, and, it, and it's told through all stories of war. So when I returned in 2008, um, I very saw... Different, very different. Very, very different. Night and day. Uh, it really was. Uh, like I said, I made a call maybe once or twice a month at the end of the war in 2003. When I returned to war in 2008, yes, it was a counterinsurgency, but it really... Uh, soldiers are a reflection of society. So soldiers that are connected in society are, are, are connected at war. So by the time I went back in 2008, you know, we had email, texting, Facebook, everything. Uh, my soldiers, as I took command of 150 soldiers, would come together to go outside the wire, do a mission, and come back, and then get online. Um, and I, I try to put stories on why that's concerning to build that bond. That bond is literally, I think, the lifeblood of a soldier in any war. And I just got back from Ukraine. I, I saw it there. But what I discovered in 2008 is it was going unchecked, this, this connectivity to the outside war. Um, and and I'll, I explained later in 2018 when my wife went off the war and I was at home with the kids, being trying to be a super dad, uh, probably failing at that, she got to talk to the kids every day. So in 2008, though, I saw the reflections of what would happen. Of course, that's a, it's a huge positive. But really what I say is the veil between soldiers and their families and the veil between soldiers and the public, or us, is gone. There's just, there's just no separation in time or in space to connectedness between the military. You can say it's social media, but it's, it's any connection, the ability to... So where that becomes troublesome is that if... If you, we know throughout the history of war, soldiers only survive wars, they only fight wars for each other. If they spend as much time talking to their social support back home, is that detracting from their bonding together? I believed it was in 2008, to where I even, we were even experiencing trauma, because you build bonds through shared hardships, and that can be really bad hardships. Hopefully it's not traumatic, but like that jump, it was traumatic. Um, but we all can now say, do you remember that time? So there's one instance in the book that really was the New York Times op-ed that became the book. When we were attacked, my unit was attacked on a road by a bomb. The bomb kills a, a young child. And it was really traumatic to the whole group. And I could see that in them when I visited them. And within two hours, they're back on base. Uh, and I went to go find them, hoping that they were sitting around in groups talking to each other about what had happened. Because... I think that gets missed in the Band of Brothers movie as well, is that not only the, ex the experience of war, but it's the experience of, of coping with it together, sitting around the campfire. That is actually what allows humans to, in to do war. So what I found in that 2008 is that they came back from that, a traumatic event, and then they connected and started telling their loved ones back home about it. I'm not saying that they didn't have bonds. I'm saying that this um, potentially... Um, complicated the yeah, bonding. The, the distractedness you had, you really mentioned that in your book, and I'll, I'll mention kind of just very briefly the one specific story you talk about where a soldier who's having a crisis back home because of his pregnant wife, uh, she's in trouble, uh, and uh, you know your 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 sergeant comes out and says, you know this this guy cannot go out on patrol today. You know you ask and inquire what's going on, uh, and it's that kind of distractedness where where the home front is actually in real time. Uh, affecting what's going on in theater. Unlike any other war, I mean, not, not that this is 2008, the first time it happened. It, it, this has slowly progressed. That a soldier will have a foot in both worlds. Of course, if they're connected to the home front, they're now experiencing any stresses that are at home that they may not have been. So this one instance was a, a soldier with a girlfriend pregnant with his child, overdosing on drugs. And he gets that message in real time and can do nothing about it. So then he gets helplessness. Um, but just a wreck and could not patrol. He could not go outside. He was combat ineffective, uh, could not go outside. But that's the reflection of what I try to say is that now, and, and for, their, for the future of war, soldiers will have a foot in both worlds. There is no separation. Um, and the home front will have a foot in war like they've never had it. So there's instances of, of soldiers being online and getting shot while talking home. Um, and that's the reality of this new war experience. So let's talk about Alpha Company, which is, <laughs> in my view, one of the, the other primacy 
of, of the book, where you took um, a company that was failing um, due to poor leadership um, to a company that succeeded. And can you talk a little bit about that? But before we do, there is someone in the audience, and I'm going to point him out, and he's going to stand up. Uh, Lieutenant Kane, stand up. Thank you for being here. Thank you. So talk about that story. So, so Lieutenant Mike Kane back then was a member of Alpha Company, 1st Battalion, 68th Armor, when I took over as company command. Um, so I took over, I was actually flown into combat, which is part of the story too, is that, which we have a question earlier about the all-volunteer force. Um, the Army was struggling to keep the manpower it needed to fight the war. That's a part of the story. It's, it, it had to be known before starting the story. Um, I took a company in combat. I was flown into combat, which isn't normal to not train with a soldier, the unit before you take command of it. Um, the, the company I took command of had been allowed to, to atrophy. And I tried to explain this in the book, and I've learned, I actually discovered well after the experience that you know, a, a, a military formation is a very complex system. Uh, made up of you know, discipline and chain of command and group norms and cohesion, all this. It's, it's actually a, a, a very complex system. And really one thing can, go, can be allowed to atrophy, like let's say chain of command. Like a good formation can actually do great things even without the officer or whoever the leader is because the system of a military is in place. Well, Alpha Company, um, before I got there, the chain of command had allowed basically every functioning system of a military to atrophy. And when, when there's a power vacuum, power will still be established. And it's, I call that the Lord of Flies effect, which is a great book to teach you that when there isn't structure, or you know, it, it will form. And that was really, I almost called the book Lord of the Flies part two. Uh, but Alpha Company had been allowed to atrophy. Um, and, and Lieutenant Kane was there before I even got there. So he has a, a better view than I did. Um, but the, the company also, the night before I took command, two soldiers were in, the, in their living areas um, doing drugs and, just, and decided to play a game where they push a gun against each other and pull the trigger. It won't, it won't fire. And so they, planned it. They, they decided, while into basically intoxicated, to do that with a loaded weapon. And one soldier shot another soldier in the neck um, and, and instantly turned him into a quadriplegic. Uh, very sure, I had actually left, I, had, I was actually there, and I had left the base, the little uh, where they were, to go in, inspect somebody else. Uh, very traumatic to the whole company, uh, to see that, to deal with that. When about 12 hours later, uh, the, the company was attacked by the enemy this time, um, with 10 200-pound bombs landing inside their small base. It was, it was a really a, a Hezbollah weapon that was deployed into Iraq. They called them five destroyers because they were so impactful. So on this little base, you know, about as big as, you know, slightly bigger than this room, um, 10 100 to 200 pound bombs landed inside the base after they had just experienced that soldier getting shot in the neck. So normally a unit would be able to, you know, the resi resiliency of a military formation is that they can take 80, 90% casualties. There's, there's stories of uh, you know, soldiers in the hurricane forest taking 80%, 90% casualties and still functioning. But when a company like this had, had been allowed to atrophy, there was no cohesion. There was really no leadership. They were driving around. To take an impact like that, it's really hard to recover from. So that night, they, they fired the, the commander and put me in and said, fix it. So in the book, I try to explain what I did to try to rebuild that company, literally in combat while they're still having to patrol every day after those two traumatic events. This is going on at the same time where you're jumped into a unit where you're going from to Bradley's when you had no experience about Bradley's and you had to, if I remember, fake it. Yep. And I, I explained it. So imposter syndrome was a, a real thing for me. Even though I'd when I jumped into combat, I was a sergeant first class. I had been a sergeant first class, turned lieutenant. Like, there's nobody who's going to question my expertise in, in, in infantry stuff. I still had imposter syndrome. 
So when they gave me a call and said, hey, you're going to go take a mechanized company of Bradleys and tanks. Like, ah, I've, never, I've never even been near one. What do you mean? Don't I need to go to a school or something? They're like, no, no, just get there. Uh, so I flew in, and, and even Mike, unless he read the book, didn't know that I'd never even been in, around a, a Bradley. So the first time I was ever in one was after I had taken command. Yeah. Um, talk about the, uh, the event where it kind of uh, turned the company around, and it went from kind of the black sheep to this is now a functioning unit. Yeah, so th- that's Mike's story, but I'll tell it. Um, there, there is an element of black sheep. So th- there's a real famous book, well, famous to me, called Black Hearts. Um, there's many motivations for me to write this book. One's just to tell my story, but there's a book called Black Hearts uh, about a company who really goes down this path, the same path that our company was. It actually leads to massive war crimes and the really bad things that the unit did. Alpha Company was on that path really strongly. And some of the things that's necessary for a unit to lose its, its cohesion, its group norms of doing the right thing versus the wrong thing, is that it needs to identify itself as outside the, the institution, outside the group, a black sheep. No matter what they can do, they can do no right. And that was present when I took Alpha Company. So not only did I have to make it recover, I had to build its identity back up as a, as a powerful unit. Um, not everybody expects... So that's a real psychological thing. So I worked really hard, and, and I almost and there's one story that's important to me where I had to put my own career on the line to protect protect them as an organization. When one of our Mike's Mike's buddy had an accidental discharge, um, uh, his weapon went off when it wasn't supposed to, which is a big deal, and I had to protect that because I thought it was the best thing to protect the the identity of the company. So as the weeks after I took command, we, we tried to rebuild as much as we could. We tried to eliminate the informal leaders that were really a bad influence. Um, and we started getting missions in which we were hunting the enemy. Um, and when you're rebuilding an organization, you, of course, you've got to give them wins. I mean, it's the same in sports. It's the same as there has, they have to be show that the hard work they're doing equals results. And, and I, we were really struggling even after we had really started to rebuild the company. We were doing these missions to raid and find you know, the, the insurgents, the, the, the terrorists. So we'd do these missions to go out and find them, and then we'd miss them. And we really we were practicing this drill, and they were getting better. And Mike's platoon um, was really working hard itself to build its identity to be the best, like all the, these things. And they had one operation. We actually didn't know who we were going after, um, to go after a guy uh, in Mike's patrol, I, I just happened to be in the area um, with him, does this raid where they enter a courtyard and there's 100 men when there was supposed to be a house. But it, actually the imagery was wrong. Something, this is what happens. The satellite imagery, there wasn't a house there. It was just a field of 100 men. Uh, and you know, this, this is a platoon of like 18 guys who he, he, him, he made a decision to still execute the mission and round up a hundred Iraqi men to identify the one enemy that we were looking for, and they did it without even thinking. And I think it's a great example of sacrifice. The soldiers were responding without thinking um, to protect each other. Um, and, and when there was a runner, um, two of his soldiers in full kit outran somebody in, in, a, in a, a long, we had a different name for it, but a long... Uh, a long outfit that men wear in sandals. Uh, we call it a man dress, and I'm sorry if that's offensive, but it looks like a dress. Um, but they, they, these two soldiers somehow, in adrenaline boost, run this guy down who had taken off, had started running, and they caught him. And, and oh, by, and ended up that, that, that was the guy we were after. He was the division's high-value target, which is a big deal. Um, and all the calls started coming in that, Alpha Company had done something great. And from then on, we were the go-to. We had been gone from black sheep to the number one preferred unit. Um, when I interviewed General Mattis last year, and we spoke about leadership and separation, um, or the line of separation that you have to have between being a leader and your staff. And you also touch upon this in, in your book. Um, so in your view, um, how does a good leader get to know 
the folks in the company or the unit or the staff, whether it's business or uh, doesn't make a difference, business or military, um, yet still be able to tell them at a drop that, you know, it's time to go and charge up that hill, knowing that they might not come back. That's a, a really complex question, actually, I, that I, I still process. I, I still think about all these topics even after I wrote the book. I mean, it's called the take the hill the moment. Uh, when, you know, the officer who makes the call, um, there's a definition of discipline, right? Responding to orders be, that are given and also doing the right thing in the absence of orders. So when I was with the Alpha Company, there is shared hardship, but there is a separation between the leader and the men, but that it's not a one-way separation, it's two-way. So if it's genuine, and I try to talk about the forms of power there are different forms of power, and one that you know, um, really directive style, which seems to be the Russian way of power. Um, and then there's the tra- you know the the reverent power, where your soldiers actually know you care about them. So that trust, but they also understand the the roles of every individual in the group. Um, there, and that's pretty clear on the military. So I think it's it's same thing that how cohesion builds in the soldiers, what they call a primary group cohesion. There's also a, a um, which I kind of struggle going from enlisted to officer, is that officers sometimes are told the day they join that you should love your men. Well, love is something that's developed. Uh, so you have to, sir, you have to, you, you have to establish that friendship, but also within the positions. And um, me and Mike are, are close friends now, but at some point I knew that if I needed to, I, would, I could order him to attack the hill. Not, in, even if it meant, you know, I wasn't sure that they'd survive it. What I really uh, thought that set your book apart from, and there's a lot of memoirs out there about Iraq and serving in Iraq and serving in war, but what you talked about in the latter part of the book is just so, so cool. Where you went from leading men, women in combat, to another very more important role of being a dad and then supporting your wife while she was serving overseas in combat. What was that transition like and what were the challenges of that? I mean, if I had to just answer the question, what was it like? It was very traumatic. Uh, It was harder than anything I ever did in the military. Um, So my children, when I retired after 25 years, you know, I struggled, of course, with identity and being a veteran and not having that brotherhood. Um, I think I still struggle with it, even though I have a job that keeps me connected. So I was, not only was I in a transition period coming out of the military, I was now going to be left alone in charge of children, which is dangerous. Uh, <laughs> uh, because if there's ever imposter syndrome, you know, a lot of things in the military we do, and we don't even know it, are about control. It's not that you control chaos, but you believe you have a sense of control. If I do these things, I'll survive. You know, if I teach the men to do this, they'll survive. Well, being a, you know, my wife goes off, children are seven, five, and three. There's no control over children. They don't listen to anything you tell them to do. Uh, there's no... I think, your, I, I think your mic went out. But, uh, you want to do the mic, uh, the, the, the handheld? So there's no feedback. In, in, in wars, there's immediate feedback from the enemy. If you mess something up, he'll, they'll let you know. Um, if I was messing my kids up, there was no feedback till later. So I, um, the, the part where, uh, one, I try to be as truthful as I could. Unlike my, my memoir portions of, of, of combat, some of that is reflective. I had to do interviews with people that served with me. This was straight journaling. Uh, so I wanted to make sure the emotions were, were true. Um, but also, I, I thought I was a know-it-all, so I thought my wife, who I had more combat time than her at the time, although we met in combat, but I had more time than her. So I thought I knew better than her, so I wanted to keep her separated from the stress of home. But she could talk to the kids every night, so it didn't matter what I said. And she gave me very spe- specific instructions, like, don't ever hide anything from me, don't keep anything from me, so I couldn't finish this book about how does that instant connection between home and war without being the home part. 
and that's when really I started to finish the book, as I could watch every night um, my children talking to mom and transitioning from she needed to talk to them more than they needed to talk to her. Her greatest fear is being forgotten. I'm sure every soldier that's ever gone has dealt with that. Um, and also watching as virtual, I'm a strong believer that virtual doesn't replace the physical. Maybe it helps, but the, I try to put in there how my kids actually responded to the stress of not having, or potentially the fact that they had her in their lives but didn't every day, to the point where they said, no, I don't want to talk to her. So how much that would hurt my, I don't know, and I've asked her, and she's, she's very stoic. Uh, I'm sh I, that was, it really hurt me the day I handed my kid an iPad and I said, I don't want to talk to mom. And I had to have that conversation with them, like she needs you more than, you know, as much as you need her. Um, so it was really, uh, a, a really traumatic for me for multiple reasons. Hopefully my kids, and I put an epilogue on there, hopefully they, they're okay after that experience because I try to run, you know, structure and all this stuff and it never, it didn't work out. <laughs> Let's let's switch topics to the uh, kind of the news of of the day, or at least the news of the year, and that's to the war in Ukraine. Uh, you have been there uh, as recently as July. Um, can you talk a little about about what you experienced while you were on the ground in Ukraine? What you saw? Um, any other thoughts that you might have on that? Yeah, that was a, a, a really amazing experience. I have a dream job where I get to travel the world and, and go to the, although some people might not view that as a dream job, but I travel into war zones and, and study battles so that the right histories are learned and we can learn from other people. So I wanted to go to Kyiv, which is the capital of Ukraine, where they, they defeated the second most powerful military on paper. We all know that's not true anymore, in Russia. So I, went, I wanted to do interviews of soldiers who had defended the city of Kyiv um, what I found was really civilians who had fought. Um, I found some, you know, I went to Bucha and Erpin and places where genocides uh, had occurred. But I didn't know what I would find was, um, I'm not saying I'm, you know, war is, is, is horrible, right? It's the worst human experience in life. But what I found was a population of people that were unified. Um, we have experienced that a couple times, as in me as an American, of course, after 9-11, it really meant something to be American and be unified. I've been in many war zones, you know, with Mike in, in Iraq. I never felt that human pure, you know, unifying feature that they had, even in suffering. I mean, I spent the most time actually in Bucha talking to the, the people who were still there ready to defend their country. I mean, of course, I found military tactics, but I was not expecting to find that amount of unity in, in, I think it really ties to my book and things that I still struggle with. And, and I was, we were talking earlier about that element of brotherhood. We call it the band of brothers effect is one of the reasons that the, the veteran struggles. Some veterans, I don't speak for all veterans, of course, I struggled. Many veterans that I know struggled with being separated from that experience of that type of community, tribe, brotherhood, and not finding it when they go back to their communities. In Ukraine, I felt it in children, I felt it in the elderly. Their struggle is extremely unifying. Uh, and the stories will be a part of their identity for the rest of their lives. Um, their stories of how they defeated Russia and, and fought for their freedom. As much as you know, our stories of Concord and Lexington and, and Yorktown that are important to our history, I was seeing it in real life, and I wasn't expecting that. Um, I got one more question I'm going to ask you, and then we're going to turn it over to the audience for their questions. Uh, and that I guess continues on with the, uh, the situation with Ukraine. So you are, uh, as we read the, your bio before, and uh, you, can, you actually have really written the book on urban warfare. Um, with your expertise in mind, um, what is going on right now in Ukraine, and what are the lessons that we, the United States military, are learning from this conflict? So that's a tough one, too, because it's what, are, what am I learning and what are we learning? Uh, so the, the U.S. military is it's a giant institution. I mean, it employs more people than Walmart. I mean, it's, what are they learning from Ukraine? I, I, I know some. 
What should they be learning from Ukraine? Yes. What should they be learning from Ukraine? That's the good one. Um, all roads lead to urban. So m militaries are very cultural. It's really hard for them to change. There, there are lots of people that study this, um, to change or believe that what they're doing won't work. Um, urban is, is the future of humans. humans. It's, it's in Ukraine should be taught the lesson that there's no, or even if you think back to World War II, think, tell, you know, some historians will be able to mention a, a battle that didn't happen in the city, but they're going to remember many of these city fights. In Ukraine, it's, it, it's the clearest example that the, we have that the world is urban. I mean, it's unlike World War II, when you could find large swaths of open areas to have big battles for. Ukraine has showed that even in Ukraine, where major battles happened in World War II, it's no longer rural, it's urban. I mean, 180,000 people move to a city a day across the world. Most of the developed world is 80% urban. Like, you're not gonna find space to have a big battle that's not going to be urban. But in, in Ukraine, it should be teaching that there was one, the one battle that mattered for all of Ukraine. That was the Battle of Kyiv. And if the Russians would have been able to penetrate in the city, the, the war would have been over. Of course, there would have been a big insurgency and fighting might still be going on, but the, the, the war would have been over. Russia would have raised the Russian flag over the Ukraine parliament. It would have been a Russian you know, fighting state, but it wouldn't Russian. Urban battles are the economic engines, the seats of political power, the everything to nations. They, they are nations. Nations become nations, usually start as cities to include Ukraine, uh, even the United States history. Um, wars will be fought in cities and for cities of the future. Ukraine should be teaching everybody that, and we have to adapt to that. Of course, the US military is the greatest military in the world. There's no question of that. Um, but it has to take the lessons of Ukraine about the urban fights and then make major changes within our weapons and our training and everything. Okay, so we're going to open up the uh, open up this up to the audience. Uh, if you have any questions for Colonel Spencer, please raise your hand. We'll start with the boss, <laughs> Executive Director Gleaves Whitney. Thank you for this wonderful discussion. You're conducting the questions and your answers. Uh, it, it is uh, spinning off a lot of questions, I think, in so many of us. And I guess the question I'd ask, based on a couple of things you were talking about. A moment ago, the Russian army, are they not as effective as they should be because they are not as connected or they are, what's the problem with the Russian army? <laughs> That's a long conversation, actually. I'm, I'm with the person who said, who cares? Um, yeah. So I think the number one reason, of course, there's lots of um, corruption and graft and readiness and, and older weapons and older thinking about doctrine. The number one problem in the Russian military is that it's not built on trust or love. It's not. It's built on, it's built on a different form of power, legitimate power or, or direct power. They, they actually beat and rape soldiers when they enlist into the military. They, they use their soldiers as, as cannon fodder. Um, it, the U.S. military and most Western militaries is built on love. Um, and I hope that comes through in my book. Um, it's built on love. It's built on service. To, it's, it's complex. But the number one Achilles heel of the Russian military is it is not built on love. It's not built on trust. So no matter if it would have even had the best equipment in the world, our equipment, it still would have been subordinate to Ukraine's people fighting for love, in my opinion. No, I, I think you're right. I mean, myself, having lived in Russia for, for a few years, the corruption is just insane. It is just amazing. The stories that I would hear from either Soviet military veterans or Russian military veterans on the corruption, of specifically the corruption of the officers, which is systemic throughout the entire, up, up and down the chain. Um, so I totally agree. Next question.
So in your travels there in, to Kiev and kind of w working with uh, civilians and, and the soldiers there, what did you find that they did specifically at the start of the war during the battles in the north for the airports in particular maybe or some of the smaller cities that turned the tide in the beginning? Because like you said, it was civilians, it sound, sounds like, more than soldiers that kind of provided the defense at the beginning. Yeah, it's a great question. So what we didn't mention, and with no affiliation to the U.S. government, uh, when, the, when the Ukraine war kicked off, I wrote a book for them, um, literally the, the day after the invasion, on how to, how to defend cities, because I've, I've studied a little bit about urban warfare. Um, and if you can, you can turn the city into a, um, a castle, if you can close the castle gates, if the military didn't get there fast enough, I mean, Sun Tzu said 2,000 years ago, the worst strategy in the world is to attack a besieged city, a castled city. Because it's true, it still is today. And that's why speed and audacity and all these things are principles in the US military and in joint forcible entry. Uh, so I wrote this book, uh, which they printed off 100,000 copies, made it digital. Um, now it's been translated in 18 languages. But one of the principles in the book is that if you can mobilize the people, so the Ukrainian military in February of 2022 was a, was a developing military, but it's only about 100,000. And by, on paper, the Russians were invading with more than that across the entire country. But if you can take tens of thousands of civilians, hand out weapons, and they have the drive in them to fight, I, I've gotten a, I haven't gotten in trouble, but I've actually said that I don't even know if we could have defended some of the cities, the U.S. military. If you would have taken a brigade of our best, um, you know, I can, like the 173rd, let's say, uh, and dropped them into a capital city of three million and said, defend this city from a much superior Russian force, I don't think they could do it. Maybe they could do it. Me, especially if we got the Air Force with us, because we, we do really good joint operations. Uh, so there's a, lot, there's a long list of reasons that Russia failed. Number one is that, uh, that the Ukrainians mobilized their civilians. The president, within hours, instilled martial law. No, no adult male could leave the country, still in effect. Handed out 20,000 AK-47s and two magazines apiece in just the city of Kyiv. Um, but that was done across the city. Um, the Ukrainian population had lots of veterans who had fought either in the Soviet army or had fought along the border after 2014 um, and had experience. So I, as I traveled, not just in Kyiv, but all around, a little bit closer to Chernobyl than I wanted to get to, um, I found civilians who had taken up arms and assisted the military. So that's, uh, in, actually in Europe, that's a, and Joel probably knows that that's a very old concept called total defense, total resistance. Total war, yeah. But you can't really know if that if you can do that, even in any country, unless it's put to the test. Lots of people say, "I'll fight, oh, I'll fight." The Ukrainians did it. Um, so they combined thousands of civilian, armed civilians with a very small population. I mean, in Kiev, it was three thousand soldiers. That's it, a one brigade. <laughs> thousands and thousands of civilians. So that's the biggest lesson. There's lots of lessons from, you know, anti-tank guided munitions to killer drones, all these things. But to, that's the overriding thing is, it, you know, war sometimes is about time, and a lot of people forget this. It, it, you can't defend it forever against an attacking military. It's also about morale. There's a big difference oh, yeah. between the morale of the Ukrainian people and the, and the invading force. So I, I actually don't like the term. Well, I know what morale is, and I talk about it in the book. Um, when I started going on TV, I, I went with it, right? So I, I knew that they wanted to talk about the morale of the Ukrainian resist fighters, military versus. But what they were talking about is will the fight. Morale is is almost it's emotion. It can go up, and it can go down. Like I could you know give them really give soldiers really good food, and their morale will be high. And, you know, I could tell them to go out and stand in the rain, and the morale is going to be low. Um, but what, what people use that term, I think, more is will the fight, and which is where I started my book. Is why do soldiers fight? Why do people fight? I mean, they were fighting for their freedom. They were fighting for their family, their survival, for their nation. 
Russian soldiers that were sent into Ukraine in the beginning, and I'm in Ukraine, were not told where they were going, let alone why they were fighting. They were actually thought they were on a, 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 a military exercise along the borders, and then sent, they didn't, many of them didn't even know where they were when they were, even got in Ukraine. And hence, why they were digging in the red forest of Chernobyl is that they didn't know they were in Chernobyl. Uh, so that means their will to fight, had even, they had been given nothing um, and then once they found out, there's lots of recorded messages that I didn't know I was in Ukraine. So you, that's what's known across the history of time from the, big, from the cavemen, is that the morale, the moral is to the physical three to one, as Napoleon said. The will to fight in an individual is always going to trump somebody who's not, have, doesn't have the will to fight. And that's why, in my personal opinion, Russia lost this war in Ukraine a long time ago. Um, of course, there's going to be a lot of Russian deaths to, till they stop, but they lost the war a long time ago. Any other questions? We have probably time for one. Oh, we have a couple more. Okay, we'll do two more. Given what you know, what strategy would you recommend for a positive outcome in Ukraine? Uh, the course we're currently on. Honestly, of course, we could speed that course up. Um, so military strategy is, is there's no, yeah, there, there's a saying that, uh, you know, in war, the simple is complicated. And everybody wants simple things to understand war, but it's very complicated, right? Um, I can talk about military formations and what we call the culmination, basically when the military is culminated and their, their leaders may keep pushing them to die. Um, but the strategy, the like we teach at West Point, like this, this hierarchy of strategy that goes back to Sun Tzu. I mean, you attack your enemy's strategy bef before you attack them, then you defeat their army in the field of battle, you defeat their alliances. Um, luckily, and I'm very proud that, you, that the U.S. has supported Ukraine from the beginning, because I think we all love, and, I, and again, this goes back to, you know, which is really just reflection, is that there is something called just war. It's, it's a theory. Um, we all love a values-based warrior, uh, people fighting for the right reason. Ukraine, if it keeps that, the fact that they're fighting a just war, they're not, if they, weren't, they were invaded. Um, they'll keep their alliance of 50 plus nations, supplying them with the better weapons. Um, they'll, they'll keep that, which is most important in strategy, right? Strategy is the accomplishment of political objectives. We could talk military tactics which I do on TV a lot, but Putin